Um, I remember recording it just after we'd written it at that place in South London. Somebody from uh, Malcolm Dunbar from East West, West paid for us to yeah. um, record in somewhere in Clapham. Together, yeah, that's right, and I remember yeah. going there on a Sunday mm. and recording it there just after we'd written it that week or something. Yeah. And, uh, so, and that's because he was trying to sign us. And every time right. somebody wanted us to sign us, we said, we're not sure if we could only hear our songs demoed. Yeah, so then, we just um, got loads of free demo time. Then it, it, would, it would make it much clearer. So they'd pay for us to do demos, which quite cruelly we'd play to other people. Exactly, yeah. Oh, well. That's always happened. Exactly. Sorry, Malcolm. But, um, yeah, I mean, we were incredibly proud of this song when we first wrote it. I remember that. I don't quite remember how we wrote it or where. I don't have a story about that, but I just remember thinking, OK, this is a new sort of, you know, this is something really special and, we, 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 you know, we, we're kind of evolving beyond the, the sort of, like, you know, scruffy, grubby little kind of angry guitar song into something more expansive. Um, and something I forgot to mention that was kind of bugging me the other day, we were talking about the, what, was, what the song was about. So many people assume this song is about suicide. And it, and it isn't. It's about kind of like people taking Valium to, it, to just to get through the day sort of thing. You know, it's not... It, it's, people always sort of think that it's got that kind of tragic edge and it. it's got a different sort of tragedy. It's supposed to be a sort of a, you know, an everyday sort of tragedy. Do you know what I mean? You see, see sleeping pills and think, oh my God, it's about suicide. And it's not. It goes, goes together with uh, my insatiable one for me. Yeah, it probably might have been written uh, not, not, for, not long after, but yeah, very similar, but just slowed down version of it. Are there? Um, oh, no. Is it called? Is it called chromatic when you, like, you put chords together that are from that aren't from the same aren't yeah. from the same group? Uh, sort it's of it's when, yeah. there's, there's lots of chromatic. It's mo instead of moving from, which is what the Stone Roses would have done. I love the Stone Roses. I'm not putting them down. Uh, I would then play. So it's moving up chromatically there. Right. Okay. Yeah. And Stephen Pills is the same, yeah. There's lots, of, lots of those things. I got into that in lots of songs. It just sort of has that jolt then, doesn't it? That's yeah. It's really nice, that bit, the bits in the verse that kind of like the chord goes somewhere where you're not really thinking it's going to go. I thought that was really clever and just, it just added to the atmosphere and took it away from being a kind of soft rock ballad, you know, kind of thing. That, soft rock ballad would have gone to it, so... And then would have gone to a minor there. I think that's why Suede, Suede could do ballads really well because... It, of what the, of the kind of strange chords that Bernard would put in there to just to take them away from the you know comfortable territory musically you know and I so I could do you know croon and pretend to be um, Celine Dion and uh, it would all somehow not sound like Celine Dion. There's lots of blues chords and stuff. Yeah. And everything, lots of sevenths and uh, and minor sevenths and uh, that follow major chords and. That's what and lots of semitone moves. What I used to always just think about is semitone. Instead of moving from to there, I'd move. And that's all it is. Uh, I think I just did it once, and somebody, probably Ed Buller, probably said, that's good. And so I just did it on everything. And it became a style, you know, and, I still do, and that's still what I do, the way I play now. You know, and it's, as soon as you hear anything, little things like that in, in guitar playing become just massive things. Like, it's, it's ridiculous to say that now, like, I'm just going... But actually, that's, that's a massive part of discovering that uh, silly little trick of, of everything I've done. At the same time I bought... Um, uh, well, I remember getting a Les Paul when we were... Um, I mean, getting a Les Paul was quite a, quite a massive thing in, uh, in about 1990. And that you and Justine gave me the money for it. I remember, and I remember going to Luton and getting this Les Paul. And this was a massive thing for me because nobody played Les Paul at the time. And, um, and I really wanted Les Paul. I can't even remember why, but I just wanted one because nobody played them. And people never do still. And then on, when we did the first album, Les Pauls, you play in a very, a very macho way. You play, it's, it's unavoidable. They're very, uh, very big sustain, yeah. very, uh, you tend to go for big, strong chords. You don't play in a sort of subtle way. If you have a 12 string or a jazz master, you tend to go for sort of little open, nice loveliness. But with a Les Paul, you just hit an A major and, and you want to hit it loud. Mm. And the same way when we, when we were doing the first album, I desperately wanted one of these, um, a 355 with a tremolo. Because when I'd grown up, I'd seen Chuck Berry had one, Roy Orbison had one, and Johnny Marr had had one. And so that's all I wanted. 
And, and this guitar, whenever you play, because it's got a tremolo, it's got this lovely bassy sound for a start, you can't hear it now, but um, it's got this bassy sound, and when you play it with your fingers, it's really... And, and the tremolo just is instant emotion switch, if you do it well. And again, nobody, just, just because simple reason that nobody was doing that, nobody, nobody used them, and I got into it, and people, because people liked it and, it, and it turned a switch with a lot of these songs, you know. All that kind of stuff, it just became like, well, that's what I do, and that's, that's what works with everybody. But it really worked, it really offsets, because I think a lot of what Brett was writing about and, and the way he was singing, Really highly emotional content. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's talked about. I don't know if people realise that. But from where we came from, from the previous couple of years, for me it was really emotional time, and really seeing that through. And again, because we were really young, and um, and the content of that, and how we changed, and um, and I, 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 we never spoke about lyrics. I mean, it's probably the first time I've ever spoken about uh, Brett's lyrics, but. Um, and we certainly would never talk about it at the time, and I never asked because it, it, it just didn't. To me, it made no difference. It didn't make any difference just to just to say to start asking. Oh, what's that one about? I'd feel like a real prick. But there was a real bit, uh, this, a lot of the time. It frustrated me that I felt like I was being a bit of a. Um, I was just fairly thick. I felt because I, because I wasn't operating on that level. But I always felt at the time it was cooler to not talk about it specifically, yeah. but to try and interpret what I understood emotionally. Because I understood emotionally up to that point when um, everyone, when we started becoming successful and everyone was talking about it, I felt I understood that more than anybody. I, felt, I definitely felt I understood it more than anyone else in the band. Um, because I felt I was more, much more connected to it, to, yeah, the, gotcha. to, to with the greatest respect than Matt and Simon were yeah. specifically. And, um, you know, the way people write songs together in partnerships is always in the understanding that, you, you know, you let something happen and then you just, you look, you look up and you go, <sighs> right, and go away then. And let's, that happened, but, you know. I think the point is with, with sort of lyrics, and I, I can't speak for other writers, but, but you know, saying what, what a song is about, it's kind of, it's almost like a, a sort of, it doesn't mean anything really. It's like songs, songs are kind of, Obviously, it's, it's so much about the, about the interpretation for me. You know, what I might, might be the starting point for me as a song, as, 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 for a song is irrelevant in a way. It's like how, people, how it reflects off other people. When people come to me and they say, you know, oh, that song's about that, and I'm kind of, I kind of nod my head. and like, well, it is for you, and that's really nice. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's totally cool. Um, I mean, a, so lot of the, a lot of the things that people, when people started writing about it in a sort of pseudo-intellectual way, yeah. I just sort of thought, I don't know what you're on about. I, I really didn't know what they were on about. But, they didn't, but the suggestion was that it meant that it meant nothing to me or that it was just going over my head completely, the lyrics, or, you know, it was just like, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah, let's get to another solo. Which I found really frustrating because I didn't have the voice to sort of say, you know what, actually, I know it more than you. I actually, understand it much better than you. Well, you'd and, been there, and, and you'd, you know, you'd sort of like you'd, you'd expect, you know, kind of been there when I, when, when lots of the, lots of the situations of this, uh, you know, kind of between sort of 1989 and and, mm. and 1993 when all those things were happening. Yeah, and you know, you, and you knew the, the personal aspects of the songs, didn't you? Yeah, and also I knew, like we were talking about pantomime horse. I mean, playing that in an empty room. I mean, that's why I'm sort of saying how important that is because that music, the next song would have come out of that situation. The fact that if you come out of that room, playing that gig and playing that kind of song, if you don't pack up and say, actually, you know what, let's pro just join a proper band or get a job, then you go on. Then you, you know, you're either stupid or you you go on to try and do something else that's even more ridiculous. You know, because you're getting into that sort of sense of drama and the sort of the, uh, emotional power of it, you know, and that's what I felt we did at the time. I felt, I felt us two certainly um, just went away from it and were sort of inspired by it. We, we you know, very sort of um, came very sort of aggressive about, yeah, very about much a very, very defensive. strong belief about what we were doing. Yeah, incredible belief, you know. If I could ever, to, if anybody ever asked me what that was like, yeah, I don't even know what. I mean, times have changed and stuff, but but just that idea of having that belief really does see see you through, mm. you know, in a in a way that you can't explain to anybody that really that that will work for you, 
but it really did.